So a lot to break down, including some campaign news. Let's get into it with this week's panel. Bill Mahoney and Marie French are both from Politico New York in what I'm calling the Politico Power Panel this week. Thank you both for being here. I want to start with budget. So Marie, something that we haven't covered in the show yet is Hochul's energy and environment plans in the budget, which was a big thing when she first took office. She did Climate Week in New York City, and she had all these plans. So let's start with what we do see in the budget under her in terms of climate, energy, that type of stuff. Yeah, so um, probably one of the bigger things is the bo- boosting the Bond Act to four billion, mm. and you know, adding some money in there for green buildings and green schools. Um, that's probably you know one of the biggest, I guess, wins for environmentalists. Um, but she had already announced that, as you noted during Climate Week. The the other like newer thing is boosting the Environmental Protection Fund, which is the state's signature fund to fund like open space conservation and other priorities. To 400 million, which will be the the highest level, you know, if the oh, legislature wow. goes along with it. And it was 300 million previously, right? Yeah, it was it was um, slashed dramatically, sort of after the recession, and then was slowly built back up. And Cuomo had it at 300 million for the last few years. Okay, so it, what is not in there is the other question, because <laughs> you know, for as many things that are in there, we know that the environmental advocates are going to say, well, she didn't have X, Y, and Z in there. So what's not in there that they would have liked to have seen? Well, I, I think um, some environmental groups, uh, particularly you know the NY Renews Coalition, which kind of was a, a driving force behind the state's climate law, really wanted to see some dedicated, more specific funding for climate mitigation efforts. Um, you know, to build new renewables, to you know speed along this transition off fossil fuels, and they were largely you know disappointed by by Hochul's budget. I think because there wasn't like a huge pot of money that she designated for that. She did have, you know, some money under the housing fund to start electrifying some homes um, and move that process forward. She did propose a gas ban on new construction, um, and that's, you know, pretty significant to have a state propose that that would be, you know, the first in the nation for and a state to do that. Is that a gas ban on new power plants, or is that a gas ban on, like, new buildings? Like, what does that apply to? Yeah, so it's um, it would be a ban on fossil fuels in new construction for buildings. So, you know, you build your house, you can't put in, you know, gas or oil, you would have to electrify it. Um, and she's proposed to kick it kind of to a building codes council that the state has and said, you know, we should do this by no later than 2027. Um, but a lot of advocates and in, in some of the New York City lawmakers want to see an earlier date for that. They want to see it 2024, like, let's just stop putting in gas for, for our all buildings. How does the Climate Action Council play into stuff like that? Because as you and I both know, they have a, a draft scoping plan right now to get to the state's renewable energy goals. That They control that whole thing, the state's plan. So how does Hochul's plans and that play into each other? Do they complement each other or do they... Is it all part of one thing? Yeah, so actually, you know, Hochul's proposal, um, depending on what the Building Codes Council would do, really does, like, play into the Climate Action Council's draft scoping plan because it calls for an end to fossil fuels in new construction for low-rise and single-family homes by 2024 and then for all other, you know, commercial and high-rise multifamily buildings by 2027. So her proposal is in line with the draft scoping plan. That's really interesting. And... and I should note for our viewers that you can comment on the scoping plan. It's on the the Climate Action Council's website. It's all there. Um, We covered it a little bit in November, December. I don't remember when we had the commissioner on. So that's really interesting. I'm excited to see where things go in the next few months with that because we had the landmark climate law pass in, uh, was it 2019 or 2020? 2019. 2019. So this is all leading up to, it feels like we're just building and building and building to like where we're eventually going to get to somewhere where we have a actual structured plan for climate change in New York. So we'll see. I want to turn to you, Bill, and some campaign news. Campaign filings were due on Friday. That was the end of the fundraising period. So now we had filings come out this week. Let's start with the the governor's campaign filings. So what do we see as her financial position going into this year's election? She's made up for a lot of lost time. Um, The the governor reported raising about $22 million, which shatters every record we had for a filing period in New York. That's crazy. The the filing periods are usually about six months, and $12 million had been the record for a couple of decades now. And Hochul just completely blew by that, nearly doubled it, Um, which leaves her in pretty good financial position. Usually it costs about $30 to $40 million to win a gubernatorial race. And this year's cycle was a little bit weird because the incumbent governor for most of the cycle is no longer running for re-election, theoretically. Mm-hmm. Um, but 
um, Governor Hochul brought herself right into the, uh, made clear that she's um, the front runner in terms of the financial picture, at least. Do we know where the money is coming from? Does it look like a lot of individual donors? Does it look like a lot of special interests? Well, it's like we've seen with most filings of top tier New York politicians in the past. Um, it's from big donors who can afford to write big checks. If you're raising $20 million by going around and asking people for $10 at a time, that's a lot of phone calls you need to make. You're probably not going to have time for actually being governor. But if you're collecting checks of $70,000 a piece, then you know that's just a handful of fundraisers a week, perhaps. Um, <laughs> And that's really what she relied on. If you look at her filings, um, only about 146,000 of that 21.9 million came from small donors who gave $250 or less. Oh boy! Um, while about a hundred times as much money, 14.5 million came from people who gave 10,000 or more. Wow! Um, so she really turned to those people who can afford to write b bigger checks than the average New Yorker can, um, and that's and so she's right back, um, financially speaking, where um, Governor Cuomo had been in past cycles at this point. So where are her competitors in the primary? Tom Swasey and Jumani Williams are her main competitors in the primary. I am assuming they're coming nowhere close. Yeah, Jumani Williams was more, you know, like. He was outraised by a handful of state Senate assembly candidates. Oh. Um, so he's not, he's never been a strong fundraiser though. He always relies on kind of like this populist progressive network throughout the state that's willing to knock on doors and volunteer their time for him. So he's not the type you expect who big real estate's gonna be writing $50,000 checks to anytime soon. No. Um, Tom Swasey actually had a pretty good filing. He raised over $3 million. He's already raised more this cycle than Cynthia Nixon did in the entirety of her campaign against Cuomo four years ago. So oh, wow. for a, primary challenger to a Democratic governor, he's in pretty good shape. But it just still leaves him so far behind Hochul that it's difficult to think of how he'll make up this lost ground anytime soon. And um, I don't think anybody suspects he'll be financially competitive. Right. Um, he'll be financially respectable, but not really in the same ballpark as Hochul come the run up to the primary. We got about a minute left. So looking past the primary, assuming Governor Kathy Hochul wins the primary, which it looks like she probably will now, unless some major upset happens. What does it look like in terms of her versus Lee Zeldin? We've heard talk in the past couple of months that this is the year that Republicans can gain some ground, maybe not win the gubernatorial election, but maybe they, they do a little bit better than past cycles. So Zeldin, like Swazi, had a pretty good financial um, filing where he raised over $4 million and combined with what he raised earlier in 2021, um, he's already the top raising Republican candidate for governor we've seen in 20 years in New York. So oh, wow. that's not bad. And there's talks currently underway of creating a national super PAC to support him that could theoretically raise up to $20 million, which obviously would be a bit of a financial game changer if that does happen. Although there's plenty of time things like this are talked about, but they don't quite meet their financial goals. Right. Um, but he, he does have a long fight ahead of him. Even if he does, he is able to match Hochul dollar for dollar. New York is a blue state. And that might not be enough um, just in a straight up ad campaign battle that's evenly matched come October. So we'll have to see what his plans are. Yeah, we'll see. Really exciting election year. Marie French and Bill Mahoney, both from Politico. Thank you both so much for being here for our Politico power panel here on this weekend. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> of Thank course. You. And if you missed Hochul's budget address this week, we do have it up on our website. That's at nynow.org. And we'll keep it on the homepage throughout the weekend. We are hoping to have the governor on the show soon, and we'll keep you posted on that. Until then, thanks for watching this week's New York Now. Have a great week and be well.